Brothers and sisters in Christ, good morning, morning. and welcome. Could I ask you all to please rise for a moment so that we can spend a moment in prayer and reflection. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Almighty Father, we thank you for gathering us here today in the name of your Son, to marvel at your love for your people throughout the ages, and to thank you for all your gifts, most especially the gift of your beloved Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, whose coming we await with joy all our lives, and most especially in this holy season of Advent. Grant that we may be found ready and at prayer in the day of his coming, so that we may praise your glory in your kingdom forever, where you live and reign with the Son in the unity of the Holy Spirit, who are one God forever and ever. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So we're here to talk about Advent today. And it's a beautiful season. It's made even more beautiful by Christmas decorations that are already up in, in supermarkets and in shopping malls, but we'll get to that point a little later. But more importantly than that, today we begin the journey, the spiritual journey that is our whole life. It's what it's all about. There's a bit of a difference between the beginnings of Advent as a celebration, as a season in the liturgical calendar, compared to, say, Lent. If we rewind back to the beginnings of our church, Lent is something that we can hold on to, we can focus on, because it commemorates an event that we are not just sure of, but people witnessed the apostles witnessed themselves the entry of Christ into Jerusalem, his passion, his death, and then his resurrection at Easter. With Advent, we are not dealing with something that we can pinpoint and say, hmm, there's a witness to this. Because by the time the church matured and began to grow, the witnesses to the nativity of Christ, the only one was our Blessed Mother, and she would have passed on by then. So what Advent is, is a, bit of a, is a bit of a problem and is a bit of an issue. And the church through time has actually changed a little bit of how we celebrate the season. Easter has always been the first Sunday after the first full moon of the spring equinox. So this formula you all know already. But Christmas hasn't always been the 25th of December. And it wasn't until the fourth century that the church decided definitively that the 25th of December would be the commemoration of Christ's birth. So while we've been celebrating Easter and Lent really since the beginning of Christianity, we only really started celebrating Christmas as a feast uh, in the fourth century. So that gives us a, a little bit of a, a problem. Because by that time, the church was already quite big. And so there were lots of different ideas about how we are supposed to celebrate Advent, if we celebrate it at all. And if you take a look at the, let's have a look at, yeah, the next slide. Oops. 
there are, there's a wide discrepancy in what churches in different regions in the beginning thought about the season of Advent. Some people thought that it should be four weeks, which is what we have today. Others said five Sundays in Advent. Others said the full 40 days that we have in Lent should be the season of Advent. But the, let me just try and take this out. But the thing that, everything, uh, that everyone had in common was that Advent should be a season of fasting and abstinence and of special preaching. There's not much, shall we say, disagreement about that. Fasting and abstinence these days is something that we don't necessarily associate with this season, but it is a season of penitence. In the early Middle Ages, there was a big difference between the church that was found in the monasteries. At that time, the monasteries were growing all over Europe. And the church of you and me, the secular church with secular priests. And the people who made the rules were, oddly enough, the people in the monasteries. So the monasteries were really keen on fasting and abstinence because they're monks, they live that way. So they would decide that, yes, this season of Advent, like Lent, we should all abstain from meat for the whole season. We should all fast with great piety. But of course, you have the church outside the monastery walls who say, we can't cope with this. Fasting for 40 days? I mean, we're, we're, we're normal human beings. We have, to, we have to work harder, maybe, than you have to work in a monastery. So how can we, how can we do that? So the question of whether fasting and abstinence was a matter for the monks or whether it was a matter for the general population was a big question. So the church didn't really rule on this. You'll know from your own understanding of the history of the church that the monasteries owned huge swathes of land and that everybody within those areas would go to the Abbey Church as their parish. And in those days, a parish was much larger than we have it uh, today. So to a certain extent, they were very influenced by the spirituality and by the regulations and rules that governed monasteries. So the fasting period in the beginning, in the early Middle Ages, began with the Feast of St. Martin on the 11th of November. And Advent was known as St. Martin's Lent. Now, we all know that, I think it was yesterday, in America, they celebrated Thanksgiving. So, actually, it's all connected. I'm not that familiar with the history of the Americas and why Thanksgiving is there. I know it has something to do with Red Indians and, and, other, and other things. But primarily, it is Thanksgiving for the harvest in the original agrarian calendar. And that is also the beginning of Advent. And the period, the day after St. Martin's, which was the 11th of November, was the day the harvest was all brought in. And then they would have a giant celebration, much like the Mardi Gras, the, the Tuesday before Ash Wednesday, where Mardi Gras, Gras being fat, where basically you go to the pantry at home, any butter, any lard, anything fatty, you take it, you cook it in your pancakes or in whatever you, you have available, and you feast on it, because during Lent, you wouldn't eat fat from meat. And the same thing went in those days uh, for Advent. So they had a giant Mardi Gras on the Feast of St. Martin. And after that, they began a season of penitence with fasting. Pope St. Gregory the Great, so Gregory the First, he was the first person to really set things in stone when it came to how we celebrate Advent. And he was around, his pontificate was 590 onwards, uh, let me see, until 604. The thing about Pope Gregory is that he was the first Benedictine pope. So he was a monk. And 
what I was just saying about the rules of the monastery being different from the rules of the wider church, he brought the two together. So what he saw from his seat in Rome was that people were doing whatever they wanted. So, and, and that wasn't right. There needs to be some sense of conformity and unity in the church. And so he decided that five Sundays would be the period of Advent. And he prescribed fasting and abstinence on the Wednesdays and the Fridays during the five-week period leading up to Christmas. Not everyone agreed with him. We all know that we have a, a very rich church history, uh, rich not always necessarily in a good way, and the church of the times was also suffering from uh, certain decadences when it comes to um, personal spirituality, shall we say. So not all the priests were going to toe the line with what Pope Gregory wanted, however great he was. Um, not everyone was following him. But the idea that this is a season where we have to stop where we have to think about what is happening or what happened in the advent of Christ. This is very, very clear. And if you take a look at um, the, the history of the church at that time, the relationship between the papacy and the emperors was not often very friendly. So the Emperor Charlemagne, the great Roman emperor, uh, decided that he wanted to exert authority over the church. So he would call the bishops from all over the place to come to him. And many different times of year, he would just say, like, come, as a show of his authority over the church. So when I call you, you bishops have to come because I am the Holy Roman Emperor. That stopped in... Ooh, that stopped in Advent and Lent because the bishops were adamant that I stay in my diocese during this period and that even if the Holy Roman Emperor comes and with a messenger to say, you must come to me, they wouldn't move. And these were the only two times of, year, of the year that the bishops were completely adamant that they had to be with their flock. And the reason why is because from the earliest times, from, so from the times of St. Bernard and before then, St. Augustine, there was a very special level of preaching that went on during this season. It was a season of education. Now, we all know that, um, I mean, those of us who are here, maybe not so, but if you notice how during the period of ordinary time, gradually our numbers fall in attendance at Sunday Mass, for example. It peaks at Easter. Maybe by the time of Pentecost, it's still at a reasonable peak. But in those Sundays that used to be called Sundays post-Pentecost, it just gradually drops, drops. The audience, the congregation becomes smaller and smaller as we travel through the time, uh, the time of ordinary time. And this is not just about us. We sometimes think of ourselves as a very secular society, that we're very bad Christians, that you know, we should do a lot more to maintain the Sunday obligation, but this has been the case through the beginnings of the church. And Advent came in as a very loud wake-up call. You will come because your bishop is there celebrating mass to hear his sermons to hear him preach and if you've read some of the sermons of these bishops you will never again say that our priest's sermons are long <laughs> the sermon of saint bernard on the first sunday of advent and this is bernard of clairvaux so he was a good talker um, in in, say, the divine office, that kind of type, 
it would go on 16 pages. 16 pages. So even if you are reading it at, a, a, at quite a fast pace, and he wouldn't have been, if you're reading it at quite a fast pace, you're talking about maybe an hour and a half to two hours worth of sermon. But what I'm sure of is that they had people going around the villages to make sure that everybody was in church. So everybody had to come. Nowadays, Advent has become less emphasized. If we look at the graph of people coming to church, it will suddenly peak at midnight mass on the 24th. So it will, it will drop. And then midnight mass, everyone's Catholic. And then it will stay there until probably epiphany sort of time. It would sort of drop in that very awkward period of ordinary time between Christmas and, and, and Lent. Ash Wednesday, everyone will come. No one will go to confession, but everyone will come. And during Lent, we all begin Lent with this great piety that we're going to, I'm going to go to Mass every Wednesday and Friday, or I'm going to go to Mass at least, th at least three times during the week, or whatever resolutions we make. But it never really happens. So by the fourth Sunday of Advent, uh, by the fourth Sunday of Lent, things are starting to drop down again. By Passion Sunday, by Palm Sunday, people are sort of thinking, the gospel is very long. <laughs> and I've got to stand through all of that. So people weigh up Palm Sunday. You go to a church maybe where there's not so much fuss. So when it's done properly, you have different people coming to the microphone. And believe it or not, that actually takes time. So if the microphone is here, and then Jesus says two words, uh, and then he backs off, and then the other person comes in and the crowd says, crucify him. And he goes. And then Pilate comes and says something. It actually takes a really long time to get through, but there are some churches that read it very quickly because the priest does it by himself. So you just stand there and you just read the gospel right to, to, to the end of the passion. And that seems, for some people, to be preferable. Easter Sunday, everyone goes again. So we have these waves of attendance at church. And unfortunately for us, and unfortunately for the church really, Advent is not considered anything more than a preparation, and this is going to sound wrong because it is a preparation for Christmas, but it's not considered anything more than that. It's sort of the time when we put up our Christmas decorations, or it's uh, uh, the time when we start singing Christmas carols. And, you know, all of this has its place, but there's not the call that existed in the beginning. Now, Pope Nicholas is the one that we have to thank for having four Sundays in Advent. So this is how quickly things change. So Gregory, 590 onwards, said five Sundays. Pope Nicholas, who was around uh, about 850, his pontificate, said, no, 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 no. We don't want to be bothered with uh, too much of uh, this stuff. We cut it down to four Sundays. That's more than enough. But Milan, very, very different the Episcopate of Milan, they have their own liturgy. Even today, the Second Vatican Council changed a lot of things, but it didn't touch the liturgy of the Archdiocese of Milan. And they still have six weeks of Advent. The original, original six weeks of Advent. Um, and, but the rest of the church, thanks to Pope Nicholas I, we are now down to four weeks. And Pope Nicholas was one of the, he was the Pope of all popes in that he was perhaps the strictest of the popes in the early church. The popes liked to think that they, that everyone listened to them, but you'll all know that actually very few people listened to them in the beginning because you have different bishops and there's an argument that maybe the Bishop of Antioch is bigger than the Bishop of Rome. After all, Peter was there first. So perhaps that sea is more important than the Sea of Rome. Then you have the whole of the Eastern Church, which at that time was still one, which believes that it is more important than the Western Church. So the, 
the popes didn't carry the kind of authority even that they have today. You'll see that as soon as the pope today issues an encyclical, the church straight away has catechesis on it. There are copies made available. It's available online. The pope speaks today from his balcony in St. Peter's. Tomorrow, it's translated into all the languages that you can think of and is available online. The pope is a very powerful person today. They weren't before until Pope Nicholas came along. And Pope Nicholas was not very nice at all. God rest his soul. But he's Pope Saint Nicholas. Pray for us. Um, he was incredibly strict. And so he said, everyone has to listen to me. And he's the one, actually. Um, have you noticed how churches in Europe, the steeple, at the top of the steeple, they have a, a, a cock at the top of the steeple. He's the one who put them there. He decreed that every single church must have a cock on top of the steeple to remind everybody of Peter's denial. And I think actually he was just testing his authority. So he says, I want cock on top of every steeple. And lo and behold, the whole of Europe had chickens all over the place. <laughs> and, and it worked because he was a very strict pope. And he's the one who decided that it's got to be four weeks. And that's why we have four weeks now instead of the six. But he couldn't touch Milan. No one can touch Milan. Prada is from Milan. You can't touch Milan. <laughs> But what is the meaning of Advent? Can we click on to the next slide? Okay, we all know because English, it's an English word as well, so Advent means coming. So we are all very familiar with that, the advent of such and such. And we know because it, Advent ends in Christmas that it's all about preparing for the coming of Christ. Christ is in the little baby Jesus in a manger that we set up at home or that is set up in, in churches. And this is also all well and good. It is the preparation for the beginning of our, the narration of our salvation. Because when Christ came, our salvation began. We're quite happy with that so far, hopefully. Let's take it a step further. Why did he have to come? Why was the incarnation necessary in the beginning? Well, it was necessary because we're human and we're very, very fallible. And God, through time, had done lots of things to try and teach his people to be better people. Uh, not just one covenant, but several with the chosen people to try and call them back to God. And eventually, with the covenant of Moses, he said, okay, I'm fed up of talking with you people. These are now a whole set of laws that you have to obey. You obey them, you get eternal life. You don't obey them, you don't get eternal life. Simple. So then he backed off. God, and even the Psalms, God actually says, I'm now leaving you to your own devices. There's nothing more that I can do. I've done all that I can. If you continue to turn away from me, there is nothing more that I can do. So I'm just going to take a step back from the people of Israel. But of course, God is all wisdom. And his plan from the beginning was that Christ would come. And he had to come because we can't save ourselves. It's just totally impossible. The, the, the Mosaic law, despite how many of the Pharisees and Sadducees in Jesus' time, they would believe that they are fulfilling it to the letter, but not one of them could save themselves through the law because no one is perfect. So that even the Sadducee who keeps every single letter of the law but thinks something bad, and this is the worst thing, we are given this thing. We can act really, really well, but because we have this thing here, the mind that's capable of thought and is capable of good and bad thought, this is what condemns us, unfortunately. That moment that the Sadducee thinks of doing something bad, he's already broken the law. He's already condemned, and he's condemned himself. So the incarnation had to happen because we're all, we are all tainted by the sin of Adam, 
And despite the fact that we have free choice, we are incapable of, in thought, word, and deed, of following every single law that Moses gave from God to the chosen people. And so it takes someone perfect. It takes someone perfect to live a perfect life, to actually die, which is the punishment for sin, human death. We can get into hell during Lent, but human death is the punishment for sin. That's what Adam and Eve got as a result of taking that apple and eating it. So it takes somebody who is completely perfect to live a perfect life and to die a death that is so unwarranted. He did nothing. There's nothing that he did in thought or word or deed that you could say Jesus deserved to die. He didn't. It's as simple as that. And his death, the death of a person who doesn't deserve to die in the eyes of God, is the only thing that then releases us from that punishment. And that's why he came. So now we're going on to Easter. But there is a point to all of this. You can't take Advent or Christmas away from the cross of Christ. It's the beginning of the reason why he came. And he didn't come to be praised by angels from on high. He gets that in heaven. He doesn't need that here. He didn't come to receive worship and glory from men. He gets that in heaven. He doesn't need that. He came to die for you, for me, for every single one of us. And that is, unfortunately, for those who want to view Christmas as something that is full of joy and, and fluffy sheep and stars and angels and is, is so comforting, you can't take the cross of Christ out of Christmas. And that is why he came. And that affects not only the feast of Christmas, but also the preparation for that feast, which is Advent. Nowhere in the scriptures is Advent supposed to refer to the birth of Christ. Nowhere. Advent, let's pop onto the, the next slide. Matthew 24. If I remember correctly, Matthew 24, uh, the previous chapter 23, Jesus had just given the Sadducees and Pharisees a really good talking to. So he had condemned them in no uncertain terms. And then he wept at the end of 23, Matthew 23, he wept over Jerusalem. The beginning of Matthew 24, he says, looking at the temple, that it will be destroyed and that there won't be one brick on top of another. And of course, that is very, very sensitive to the Jews because the destruction of the temple is symbolic of the end of time. So Jesus said this about the destruction of the temple publicly. He was preaching. So he said, look, look at the temple and hear me that before my day comes, before he comes again, the, there, will, there will not stand one stone upon another of this temple. It will be completely leveled. And so I'm sure that the Jews who were gathered listening to him thought, okay, we have a problem because that means time is about to end. And of course his disciples who were closest to him also thought, oh no, we thought that you were here to be somebody who would fight for us. 
We thought that you were here to raise an army to get rid of the Romans. But now you're telling us that our temple is going to be destroyed. You're telling us that time is going to end. And so after Jesus did all of his preaching, his disciples went with him to, I think it was the Mount of Olives. And they sat and talked to him. And they asked him this question that is here. And I'm not allowed to go away from the microphone, sorry. Because I think they're live there. They're streaming it on Google or something. Ooh. And what shall be the sign of thy coming and the consummation of the world? This is the Dari Rames uh, translation, which is historically probably the most accurate that you can get. We go back one step. So the Dari Rames Bible is translated from the Clementine Vulgate, which St. Jerome translated. So we have there, uh, et quod signum adventus tui et consummationis seculi. Seculi isn't really world. That was not a particularly good translation. Seculi is everything. The consummation, the end of everything. And adventus tui, your Advent and Adventus is where we get the word Advent. We take one step further. Matthew was written in Greek. Oh, here we have a bit of a problem. Kaite to Simeon, Tesers, Parousias, Kai Suntaleas to Ionos. Uh, Semeon is sign. Uh, parousias is, as you know, the parousia. Advent. So we have Advent in English, coming from Adventus in Latin, coming from parousia, or parousias here because of the, the, the verb ending, in Greek. And this appears a total of 10 times this word in the New Testament. There is only one time in the Acts of the Apostles where it is used as a normal verb, as in, I'm coming to dinner, um, and they use Adventus. And that seems to me to be a bit of an anomaly. They would normally use venire for come. So, uh, if I, if, I, if I come to dinner, I would normally use venire in Latin and not adventus. But that's one out of ten. The rest of them are all associated with the end of time. Nowhere, apart from in that one chapter in Acts, is adventus used for the coming of anything else apart from the coming of Christ at the end of time. And that gives us a very good idea about what it is that we are preparing for in this season of Advent. It isn't about the baby Jesus. It's very comforting to see pictures of the crib. It's very comforting to sing carols. And all of these things have great benefit for our faith. But beyond these things, in a way, we're digging deeper into our faith. In the same way as we dig from English through to Latin, through to Greek, we're digging deeper to find more important meaning to what we are actually celebrating. So Advent, when, when we're talking about the coming of Christ, it points to the coming of Christ at the end of time. Hence, all of the readings from Revelation pointing towards Christ's second coming. Now, we all know that to the apostles and to the early fathers of the church, they felt that the coming of Christ was something that was incredibly imminent. Paul speaks 
of the day being near. Peter speaks of the day being near. They lived in anticipation that Christ could come at any time. Just because he hasn't come for the last 2,000 years doesn't mean that he's not coming. And what we have lost, in a way, is that feeling of being prepared. And this may be is because we have much more of a feeling of our own immortality these days. You have to really get to sort of my age before you start worrying about uh, like a lump here or a pain there. And then when you have your first MRI scan, um, you think, oh, the end is near. And um, I mean, I can remember I had really terrible headaches at one point, really, really terrible, terrible headaches. And so I went in for a head CT. And it was that point, that was about, that was about six years ago. And waiting for that head CT result to come through was horrible. And you suddenly realize that it might not be today, pray God, it might not be tomorrow, but we are mortal. If you ask our young people today, they have no idea. They have no idea at all. They're going to live forever, they think. And it doesn't hit you until a certain point that we are actually all mortal. And this sort of feeling of our own immortality is maybe because now people live much longer than they used to before. So 80-something is not unusual. 90-something, for me, God forbid, 100 and something. <laughs> I don't think I could cope with that. But we all live much, much longer. And so our sense of our right to be alive is so much stronger than it was in the early church. When you could be cut short at the age of 30, you could be cut short at 40. Dying at 40 was very, very normal. So you have a whole different culture. Things were much more urgent. And we've lost that urgency to a certain extent. It's fine for us sometimes to think, I'll wait until Sunday to go to confession. And then you show up at Sunday, and I mean, you know the lines that can conform at the confessional on a Sunday. And it's not a particularly cool area of the church. Um, and you think, uh, no, uh, I'll come back on Wednesday when there are fewer people. And we sort of comfort ourselves that, you know, God knows. God knows, God loves me, and he does, but he also wants you to go to confession. Um, we don't think about what could happen in between. And maybe not often, I think it's actually quite difficult to sin mortally, I, I think. <laughs> um, you have, because you really have to try you have to know and you have to deliberately do something. It does happen and that's why we definitely need confession. But a lot of the times when we go to confession, it's not necessarily so urgent that if I don't go to t today, then I'm done for. But you guys don't. But there are hundreds and thousands who never go to confession, never. They'll come to church at Christmas, like we said. They'll come to church at Easter. Uh, they'll come to church when their children need baptism. They'll come to church to bury their grandmother. They'll come to church when they get married. And they haven't been to confession for 30, 40 years. That is a symptom of our immortality, our feeling of immortality. We don't need any of this. God understands. I, I've got this direct channel with God, and he tells me he understands, so there's no need for confession at all. The church was expecting in those days for Christ to come at any moment. And Advent reminds us that he can at any moment. And we, 
We've heard in the readings recently towards the Feast of Christ the King, uh, the, the, the readings for Mass, that we need to be at prayer, we need to be found at prayer, we need to be ready to greet the Lord. And we hear all of this, but we don't internalize it, and we don't understand it fully. And all of us are guilty of this at some point, skipping grace maybe before a meal, which is not, it doesn't say you have to say grace before a meal, but it's about dedicating every single moment to the Lord. And we oftentimes forget to do that. And what I really hope we can do this Advent is to make sure that we are ready, that if he does suddenly come, it should be something that we look forward to. It should be, hey, Jesus, welcome back. Not, oh, no, you have to come now. Oh. <laughs> Give me five minutes, I go to confession. Because he doesn't come like that, unfortunately. He just comes and says, you, 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 my right side, you, 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 left side. And you go, mm, but it, I, I really meant to go to confession. I was, I was in the queue. And the bell went, and Father, alas, it cannot hear. But, so, uh, so actually, I should be on that side. <laughs> but unfortunately, there's no bargaining. There's, there, there are some great points to, if, you, if you've had the privilege of uh, attending Father Justin's Masses, when he's talking about the Divine Mercy, there's a lot of truth in, in, in what he's saying. And something hit me a few, a few weeks back. It was at a weekday mass. And, um, and he said that in, I'm not very familiar with the, with the Divine Mercy, so I don't know the main, the main characters in this, but I, there's a diary, and um, there are revelations given through the diary. And one of them was Jesus speaking and saying, the time for mercy is now. So if you want mercy, come get it now like the lunch buffet later, if you want food, you come get it now. Because like the food, the time of mercy will run out. And when he comes again, we won't actually recognize him in the same way as we have read about him in the scriptures. He won't be this wonderful person who touches you on the head and says, I forgive you. He won't be the Christ who was hanging on the cross and said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Those people really knew not what they do. Unfortunately, we know exactly what we do. And that urgency is an urgency that we really need at this time. And so for that, we maybe the next one. And the next one. I'm terrible at PowerPoint slides. There are no fireworks or anything, or clapping, or, or fires, or anything. But um, there, yes. It is a time of beginning. It is a time of beginning because it's the beginning of the liturgical year. I, I actually had, when I was much, much younger, I had a lot of trouble with Advent because I really didn't understand what it was all about. And my, my, yes, my faith would wane with ordinary time. And I found it tremendously difficult to drag myself, literally, and it's, it, it, it is bad, but to literally drag myself to church on the 20th Sunday of Ordinary Time, the 21st Sunday of Ordinary Time. I think of all the names the church could have chosen for this period, ordinary is probably the worst. Because it's like, who wants ordinary? But that is what it is. And I had tremendous trouble, tremendous trouble. And my spiritual director at the time, was actually quite used to this. It was, it was cyclical. Um, I not so much lose interest, but just lose that fervor, that amazing fervor that you have at Easter when you feel that everything is good, everything is wonderful, 
And then by the 33rd Sunday of ordinary time, you're thinking, oh, I can't, I just don't feel it anymore. I just don't feel it. And I had a lot of trouble. And so I was talking with my, my spiritual director at the time, and I said, okay, look, why did they choose Advent as the beginning of the liturgical year? Why not Christmas? Okay, why not Easter? It's the most important feast of the year. Why not Pentecost, the coming of the Holy Spirit, the birth of the church? It's the church's birthday. Surely that should be the beginning of the liturgical year. Or the Ascension. There are so many things. Why Advent? And he told me, he was, he was a very patient man, because he told me more than once. He said, because what you do in those four weeks of Advent is symbolic of your whole life. And if you do nothing in those four weeks, then your whole spiritual life pilgrimage amounts to nothing. You must begin it with Advent. It is a journey. And it's a journey that is the journey of our lives. We all live every day waiting for Christ to come again, or we should be. And that's why Advent is so important. And like I say, he was very patient. So he would sit down and he would explain that you've got to understand things like the history of the church, the history of our salvation from the times of the prophets, from the time of creation, to be able to understand, to take this journey with Christ through to his death, his resurrection, and his second coming. When we reach Christmas, and this is something I, I quite like, the imagery that he gave me. We all love Christmas, so to say that what we are journeying towards is an eternity of Christmases, that every day is Christmas, it works very well for a teenager, okay? Which is what I was at the time. And so he said, so just think about it, that step by step along this journey, what you're aiming for is to arrive at a destination that is an eternity of Christmases, an eternity of Christ coming. Because he doesn't need to suffer again. He doesn't need to die again. He won't be resurrected again. So Christmas becomes that feeling, Christmas, the feeling of God being with us, an eternity of that. And if you have good vibes about Christmas, and I think most people love Christmas, the family, the, the services at church are beautiful, there's so much to enjoy about it, that this is what we're aiming for, that every day is the coming of Christ. That's what heaven is about. Every day he's there. Every day he's Emmanuel. He's God with us. And that is the whole point of our pilgrimage towards him. So Advent is the beginning of a journey. And we all, no matter what journey we embark on, we all need to do a little bit of preparation. So where are we coming from? Where are we going to? What is our destination going to be like? What's the weather going to be like? There's no use going to Moscow and taking only t-shirts with you. So you need, to, you need to understand where you're coming from, where you're going to, what route you're going to take, and who's going to be with you on the journey. And these are some of the fundamental questions that we need to ask ourselves as we begin this journey. So where are we coming from? I think we've got another slide. Where are we coming from? What is our destination? Which route are we going to take? And who are we taking on this journey? Because going by yourself is a bit boring. You always need someone to come along with you. Where we are coming from is our history. And you'll all be familiar with the, 
I'm always frightened when Ignatius walks towards me like, are we okay? <laughs> Is it too cold? Okay. Moscow. You didn't realize you were coming to Moscow today. You see, always prepare for a journey. Hopefully it will, it will warm up a bit. So, where we are coming from is our history. And you'll all be familiar with the phrase that people, if you don't learn from history, you end up making the same mistakes again and again and again. And unfortunately, that is our history. We have been making the same mistakes again and again and again. Uh, even after Christ came and lived and died and rose, we are still making the same mistakes as the Pharisees that he condemned, as the Sadducees that he was really not that happy with. So understanding that we have roots, and those roots are very, very deep of all of the religions, the religions of the book are the most profound because of their history. And understanding that history is a very important part of understanding who we are today so that we don't go and make the same mistakes. The very, very pious Pharisees who were deep inside incredibly proud of themselves. They obeyed the law when people were watching, but they didn't when people turned their backs. The peop they were very quick to condemn people. And these are all things that we need to understand because these are things that we do to certain degrees as well. Those of us who are living as upright a life as we can, sometimes we are very quick to judge incredibly quick to judge and you'll hear it said fortunately this is not so much of a catholic problem as a wider protestant christian problem that judgmentalism they they often say that catholics we're guilt ridden that we're full of guilt and actually that's a good thing because it makes us less likely to judge but if you find some of these, and not, not Protestant as in Anglican or Calvinist, because they have a bit of history too, but Protestant as in the ones that, you know, I ordain myself a minister today and um, let's all have a loaf of bread and a drink of Ribena, that kind of, that kind of Protestantism, they are incredibly judgmental. So it's like, ooh, you do that up. Uh? the Holy Spirit won't come to you. And it's like, who are you? Who are you? That's exactly what the Pharisees were doing. They would go around pointing at people, picking at their, the little things that they were doing and saying, you are condemned for what you are doing. And as I say, Catholics, we don't have such a severe problem with this because we are so burdened with our guilt that everything... <laughs> It's like, oh, have mercy on me, a sinner. And, but it's a good thing. But there is, to a certain degree, that tendency that we, we make judgments. And these are, these are things that, that Christ condemned in absolutely everyone that he, that he met. That if you judge, then you will be judged. And judging somebody, telling them that they can't do this and can't do that, or that they're doing it wrong, or that they're going to be condemned for this, I pray that we can just leave that to the Protestants. Then we won't see them later. <laughs> so for us, we need to be able to learn from that history. And it's a marvelous history. It is a great story of love. And that's all it is. If you look past the letter of the law, if you look past the scary stories of God sort of blasting cities out of the sky. If you look out beyond the condemnation of Adam and Eve and them being sent out of the garden, the 
constant message of our history with God is love. That's it. It's love. And when the evangelists say God is love, that's exactly what they mean. You don't need a deeply theological understanding of like, oh, yes, God is love, like one beaker of water that has some love poured into another beaker and then, an, and, and then more poured into a third beaker and it's all equal love between the three. You don't need the theology. What you need is love. That's it. God himself is love. And if you look at the history, our history, as the people of God, it's all been about love. And Christ came for no other reason than for love. And Christ died for no other reason than for love. And what we do when we die and please God, we go to him. We dwell in that love. We become love itself. And that's why the only commandment he ever gave was to love. There's nothing else. You love God, you love your neighbor. Don't worry about anything else. It's all love. And we need also then to understand what our destination is. Now, I don't know if any of you, have you ever watched the, I don't know whether it's available here, the British comedy, Blackadder. Okay. So you'll all know Rowan Atkinson, and you'll all know that this is, I should actually ask for the video to stop right now because it's, it's very bad. But there was a section, I think it was in Blackadder 2, where um, Blackadder, Rowan Atkinson, was made, oh no, it was Blackadder 1, where he was made the Archbishop of Canterbury by his father. And the Archbishop of Canterbury, obviously the, the most important bishop in, uh, in, in England, and there was a fight between what a person leaves to the king and what the person leaves in terms of his possessions to the church. And so Blackadder, because his father was the king, had to try and persuade the person who was dying to leave their goods to the king. Otherwise, the Archbishop of Canterbury would be executed by the king. So, of course, this is all comedy, okay? <laughs> so, the second in charge, a real holy bishop, went to this person's deathbed and, uh, and with a a decree asking him to sign his goods over to the church. And he said, so you want to be in heaven, don't you? Where angels sing and where um, it's all light and happiness and flowers. And the man said, oh, yes, 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 yes. He said, then sign, sign here and leave all of your belongings to the church. And just as he was about to sign, Blackadder pushed into the room. And he said, I know you, you have four wives. Because you don't want to go to heaven. Because in heaven, you have nothing. You just see your wife. Just one wife. That's it. And you can't gamble, and you can't kill, and you can't... Because you don't want to go to... You want to go to hell, where there is murder, and crime, and avarice, and lust, and all of these things. And the, the man on his deathbed said, Oh, yes, I'd much rather go to hell. And he said, Then sign, sign here, and leave all of your goods to the king, and he signed, and then he died, and poor thing probably did go to hell. But um, <laughs> we need to know where we want to go, and of course we know that it's that you know bad people aren't going to enjoy hell. I will say that for the record, for the camera, bad people do not enjoy hell. <laughs> okay, but we need to decide because good people do enjoy heaven. We need to make a decision now, today, where is it that we are going? And we like to think we're going to heaven, boom, just like that. But what is heaven? What is it all about? And do we truly desire it here? Most of us know. You'll even remember St. Augustine, it's like when he was saying, you know, oh, 
you know, God, give me the strength to be a better person, but not today. Not today. Because there's so much that I will want to get done first before I get baptized or before I have my last rites. So don't interrupt what I'm doing today. But yes, please, I, I really do want to be holy, just not today. We need to decide today, unfortunately, whether we want heaven and what it is that we're expecting heaven to be. Because it's that desire that puts us there. The reason why people go to hell is not necessarily because of the, 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 the symbolism of Christ coming and putting people on his right and the goats on his left. And then when you are faced with the pure glory of God and the full power of his love, who can look him in the face? A man with clean hands and a pure heart. When that day comes and he is before us, will you be able to look or will you turn and bow your head in shame? That actually is hell. That's what hell is all about. It's somewhere where we send ourselves. It's useful to have a judge coming and say, you, you are going to hell. But actually we send ourselves there. We send ourselves there because when we see God, we, it, we suddenly know. We suddenly know that no one could ever have loved us more. And we feel ashamed. And in that moment of shame, we turn from his light and from his glory. And that is our hell. An eternity of knowing that behind you, behind you, is the glory of God and his love, but you have made yourself not worthy to see it. So how much do we desire? And what is our route? So nowadays, everyone just punches it into ways or to Google Maps to tell you to turn right or to turn left. Actually, Advent is all about not needing to turn right or to turn left. As the prophet said, we are to make the roads straight, to build a highway for our God. That is, all of the crooked little bends and turns, turn right here in 200 meters, turn right, none of that. It is one straight road to the Lord. And that is our task. And our, and our task, our route, is an easy one. He just gave us one commandment. I know that there are lots of add-ons from that, but all of them have that root in that one command to love God and neighbor. Everything else flows from that. You can say, oh, but the church tells me that I have to come, I have to, come to mass on holy days of obligation. You know, that's really difficult. And that's a law that God didn't give me. What does love God mean? other than to want to be with him whenever you can be. So, holy day of obligation, that comes under loving God. Everything comes either under the love of God or the love of neighbor. And you'll see that in the, uh, the catechism, in the teachings of the church throughout history, how everything points towards one of two things, loving God and loving neighbor. And it really is that straightforward. And it's one straight road that we're taking. It's very easy to love people who are lovable. And Jesus knows that. But our task is to love not only the people who are in this room, because you are all adorable and easy to love, but the person who honks at you on the, on the road, on the way to church, the person who cuts in front of you just as you're, you're wanting to turn into the church car park, the person who shouts at you who, uh, when, when you're doing things, all of these people, the, the terribly, terribly unlovable people, those are the people that we have to love. It's easy to love each other within this family, within the family of God, but actually, we don't need to. 
Jesus also said that if you can't, it's, the, it's about the least of my brothers. It's not about the ones who are there, you know, the ones who we find it so easy to love and admire because they are so close to God, say, for instance, like our priests, that we look up to them. But the people who we think are very far from God and not worthy of God and are condemned by God or are of a different religion. It is all of these people that we are called to love because these are the least of Christ's brothers. And each of those people are the people that we need to love. And that's the difficult thing about this, this straight road that we're on. It's very simple. We love absolutely everyone, even my neighbor who has a dog that barks at four o'clock in the morning because he leaves him outside tethered on quite a short leash. And it's sort of like, so the poor thing wants to run around their animals. And it's like, why don't you just take the leash instead of waking me up daily? It's not the azan that gets me. It's, it's the dog that gets me. At four o'clock in the morning, he will start yelping incredibly loudly. And I'm, I'm quite a light sleeper. And so there are days when I think to myself, oh, this man, this uncle, a very nice uncle, actually. But, um, but I really find it incredibly difficult. And that's the person that I've got to love. All of those people who you find incredibly irritating, that you wish somehow, if there was justice in the world, and we love to say that, if there was justice in the world, these people would be punished, certain people. Unfortunately, there is no justice yet. That's coming. And until justice comes and God meets out his punishment, then actually everyone is equal before the Lord, no matter whether they believe in what we believe in, or whether they believe in their own religion, or they have no religion, whether they condemn us, or whether um, they spit on us, whatever they do to us, those are the people that we have to love. And it's incredibly difficult. And that's why we fail. I fail several times a day, not for the things necessarily that I do. I don't often go with a hammer and whack the uncle on his head. But that picture has come up in my mind. And that's the problem. As I was saying, we are cerebral people. And what happens here, oh, that's just as bad as... And that's what we have to be aware of. And there's a line of thought that as long as you don't take the hammer and clap it down on him, you haven't committed a mortal sin. There's that kind of thought, that it's only venial, you're not going to hell for that. But it actually depends on how impassioned you are about it. If it makes you so angry that you can see yourself doing it, and you think, and, and we do get this angry sometimes about some of the pettiest things, then I'm very sorry to say it is a mortal sin. Because it's not just something cursory that comes and then goes. When we feel and are possessed by that sort of anger, that's when we go home and we replay it in our minds. And we've all been there unless there are saints among us, and I hope that there are. But we've, but we've all been there, where we've gone home after a particularly nasty argument and we replay the argument in our mind, and we think, ooh, if I had been smart, I would have said this, and this would really shut you up, and then this would show you. And it's in that replaying, because as soon as we, as soon as we go home and on, on, our, on our beds at night, we have these thoughts going through our heads. That's when these incidents in a normal day when they possess our souls because we can't put them down and we keep thinking about them, then that becomes a sin that we do need to seek Christ's forgiveness for in confession. And from that perspective, we are all in need constantly of Christ's mercy. Who's our companion? We have a really great companion on this road, and that's Christ himself. And 
We have to not only know that he walks with us, but we have to want him to walk with us. He's not the person that you can take him by his hand one minute and then push him away the next. And that's very often what we do. When we're in church, we feel him. We want him to be close to us. When we receive communion in those moments, we feel Christ with us, next to us, inside us. And then when we leave church, it's like, mm, yeah, yeah. and there are some points where we would really prefer Jesus not to be there. And it's like, okay, you stand in the corner. Do you stand in the corner? Don't look. Don't look. Let me get this done first, and then you come back. Unfortunately, it doesn't work like that. He's this companion with us, walking all the way, and actually he sees absolutely everything. For, I, I don't know whether you, you read my article last week on the, the Pilgrim website about Christ the King. And I was saying that somehow this kingship of Christ, it's there no matter whether we want it to be there or whether we don't want it to be there. And there's that, that part of us that hopes that some things that we do, God didn't notice. It's like, you were looking over there when I did this. But actually, we, we all know deep down, it doesn't, it doesn't work like that. But if we really believed that all of the time, who would do anything wrong? Who would want to do anything wrong if God is with us and loves us more than, more than anything we can understand? Why would we do something to offend that love? And he walks with us. Um, we see through the prophecies of the Messiah. We see who he is. And this is very important. You need to... <clears throat> excuse me. You need to know your companion on a trip. This app that they've just developed, I saw it in the news the other day, where you can carpool with people in your area to try and save on petrol money is all well and good. Of course, you could be carpooling with a mass murderer. But worse than that, you could be carpooling with somebody who is offensive to you. You could be carpooling with, with somebody who is offensive to other people, who suddenly winds down the window and throws rubbish outside, or winds down the window and shouts at people on the street as you're going past. You need to know who you're traveling with to be comfortable. No one is going to go on a long journey with somebody that they don't like or that they don't know. And we need to get to know who Jesus is, and that is the most important thing about taking him along with us on this journey that's life. You've got to know him intimately. And Father Albert has actually been talking a lot about this recently, about this personal relationship with Christ, of falling in love with Christ. And the, the great wisdom of this concept is that that is exactly what our Christian life is supposed to be about. It sounds really soppy that you've got to fall in love with God, that you've got to fall in love with, because it uses love in our human terms. And we know that you can fall in love with somebody, but you can also fall out of love with them. And that's the, the weakness, say, of the, of, of the imagery there. But if we are talking not about human love, but divine love, then to fall in love with God is the pinnacle of human existence because God gives us love that we then give back to him. And that, that's why Christianity is really easy because God gives us absolutely everything. He doesn't ask us to give him something that we have to make for ourselves. So the age-old pagan gods where you had to make gigantic statues of bulls out of gold or... God doesn't ask any of this. He gives us everything that we're supposed to give back. It's already there. 
The love that you give God is nothing more than the love that he's already given you. And that makes things incredibly simple. So this guy that we've got walking along with us on this journey, we've got to know him as that person who loves us more than anybody else could love us in the world. And then make sure that we love him equally with the love that he gave us. Preparation for Christmas is one thing, but then preparing for the second coming of Christ is another. And that's one thing that we all have to do a lot more carefully this Advent, because we don't know the time. You'll see the world is very troubled these days, but actually the world has been troubled for a very long time. What we're experiencing here in Malaysia, around the world with wars, this has actually all happened before. There's nothing, there's nothing new ever. Humans, humans are great failures because we are incredibly predictable. We just keep doing the same thing again and again and again. And so we might feel that the world is coming to an end and there are lots of people out there who, who, who prophesy year after year, that it's going to happen this year, that it's going to happen on the 22nd of December, or it's going to happen on whatever it is, and you know, you've got to buy a bunker, or... The thing is, if we knew, it would be easy, but the fact is, we don't. We don't, but it could be any time now. And that's what we're journeying towards. How prepared are we? I used to struggle, I used to struggle with a lot, actually, I don't know why I'm here. I used to struggle with so much as a, as a, as a Catholic Christian growing up. And one of the things that was very difficult, but perhaps that's because of the younger people among, uh, among us here today will probably have a different perspective on things. But confession used to be something that was incredibly difficult for me to understand. Um, it was all about guilt. Uh, I was actually, at the request of my mother, I, of my mother, was received into the church quite late. My mother wasn't Catholic, but my father was. Uh, but I received the most Catholic education you could ever ask for from the age of six uh, in monasteries, schools that are attached to monasteries. And I can always remember uh, I didn't have to go to confession because I hadn't been baptized yet, so that was quite, quite good. But um, the, the classmates, my, my classmates would have to go every week, and you had to go, okay? There was no, there was no like, choice about it. It is ding, 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 confession time. This form goes down, they line up the pews, the priest is inside, probably with a gin. Um, <laughs> and... Unfortunately, when it's done like that, there are some times where you don't actually have very much that you can confess. I mean, we all think of, you know, little boys as being very, very naughty creatures, but actually we weren't. We were, we were like three-year-olds today. I mean, it's uh, in our teens. There, there are just things we didn't know, okay, that, that they know when they're eight today. So we were incredibly innocent in those days. And my classmates who had to go for this weekly confession thing, sometimes they had no idea about what they were going to confess. So they would sit there and they would do this examination of conscience thing. So I've actually got nothing, but you had to do it. And so some of them would actually make up stuff. <laughs> and you could hear it. So they would go in and it would be, you did what? It would echo through the, what, 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 echoing through the church. And what you end up doing then is you end up testing, you know. I haven't actually done this, but I'm going to say that I did this just to see whether I can get away with it. So, and they, and they very often did this, and they would come out chuckling to themselves because they'd just given the priest a heart attack. Um, <laughs> but that is how many people grew up in my day, where Confession was something dark and dingy, 
And it was anonymous because we should be ashamed of ourselves. You should be ashamed of, it's in, the, it's in darkness because you should be ashamed of yourself. And the penance, the penance is punishment. It's punishment. And penances now are fabulous because they're short, usually. And, and some priests don't give them at all. It's, uh... But the penances in my day, and that's still post-Vatican II, but just, only just, um, they were a form of deep punishment. There were people, because we lived in a, in a dorm, who were given the constant recital of the Litany of the Saints until Vespers. So we had to attend, we had to attend all of the monasteries uh, services at the weekend and confession would be before mass on a, on a Saturday. Uh, one penance that was frequently given by this very, very strict Irish priest, and I say that because it's unusual. Normally, if you want a quick confession and no penance, you go and find an Irish priest. Because, and it's known that those are the ones they take one minute. It's like, oh, what have you got to say? Okay. All right, God bless you. Go, go, go. Don't worry about it. But this Irish priest was, I mean, the Pope couldn't have been worse. And you haven't seen a damaging penance until you see a 10-year-old boy walking around the dorm area going, uh, Apostle Paul, pray for us. Uh, pray for us. Pray for us. Have mercy on us until Vespers, okay? And we were very innocent then. I mean, actually now, if you're not here watching me do it, I just wouldn't, wouldn't do it. But we were so innocent that we thought God was watching. And that if you stopped praying the Litany of the Saints, you would be damned to hell or worse. But that is so damaging because penance becomes something that you are punished for. And we are never punished for going to God. If we can take a look at the next slide, maybe. And the next one. And the next one. What I'm going to do is I'm going to put these, I'm going to ask Ignatius to put these slides up so you don't have to take uh, pictures and things. So, Penitere means to be sorry. That's all it means. So penitence is about being sorry. And we've all heard the phrase about, um, don't just say you're sorry. Mean, believe it, prove it that you're sorry. But you don't prove that you're sorry by reciting the Litany of Saints a hundred times between Mass and Vespers. That does nothing at all. Of course, the, the, the church in its desire to change how we feel about these things sometimes goes in the opposite direction. So I believe in some places it's quite, it's quite encouraged to have face-to-face -face confessions. And this then becomes an opportunity for like light-hearted chit-chat about all sorts of things that ends with a... a uh, that ends with the, the priest's absolution. It doesn't need to be that friendly. The reason why it's anonymous is for us to know that we're not confessing to the guy who is sat next door. We're confessing to God himself and that it is God who gives us his absolution. It has nothing to do with the priest at all. That's why it's in a box. And that's why it's anonymous. So you don't need to go to the extreme where the priest is your friend. Counseling is something that can be done outside and should be done outside of the confessional. The confessional is just about going in and saying and realizing in here what it means to be sorry. And a penance is not punishment but should be a way for you to understand or come to understand 
what it means to be sorry. And the only way that we can be truly sorry is to understand how our actions have not offended God, because God doesn't get offended. He's not me. I get offended at things. God is not offended or hurt or angered by anything that we do. But what we do distances ourselves from God. And one of the, one of the great examinations of conscience that I was taught by my spiritual director was to imagine yourself on a road where the destination is the glory of God. To imagine yourself where you are today and to look at where the light is coming from. So what do you see when you look down at the path that you're walking on? Do you see light in front of you? If you see light in front of you, then you're headed in the right direction. But more often than not, what we see is our own shadow. And it's our own shadow that is sin. When you see your own shadow and a halo of light around it, that means that you're facing in the wrong direction. And the only reason why we face in the wrong direction is because we don't trust Christ enough. It's not about him being angry with us. It's not about him being disappointed with us. He's not, because he knows exactly what we're going to do before we do it. He knows exactly what we have done, even in the, the secret depths of our heart. So how can he be offended by any of this? He's not. But what we do is we exclude ourselves from God, that turning. And when you examine your conscience for how well you are in relationship with God, look down at your feet and see, is it light or is it shadow? And if it's shadow, you're facing the wrong direction. And the only reason why we would face the wrong direction is because we think if we, if we turn around, we're going to be condemned. We're going to be burnt up by this light of Christ because light purges sin. So there's always that feeling that, you know, somehow like, like those vampires who get hit by light and then they melt, that somehow if we expose ourselves to God in all of our failures and weaknesses that somehow we will be condemned and we won't and that's why we don't turn because we're frightened because there's not enough trust there but actually when you turn around he's there waiting for you and that is what penitence is about it's about trust trusting that God loves you turning around and not being worried about being struck by lightning or whatever it is that we're we are told as children, you don't do this or else you'll be struck by lightning or don't say that or else God will punish you. It's not about karma. There is, for Catholics, no karma. There is no, you'll get your, you'll get your punishment. Not in this world. Not necessarily. God doesn't work like that. What stops us is our own lack of trust in God. And we have a lack of trust in God because we're weak and feeble ourselves, because we don't trust ourselves. But as soon as you turn, there he is. And he's not saying, say the litany of the saints a hundred thousand times. He's saying, come to me. Come to me, all of you, in whatever situation you're in, come to me. I will give you rest. And that is penitence. When you are in that embrace, there is nothing that you would ever do to let go of it. Nothing at all. But you have to turn and you have to embrace him. And as soon as you do, all the cares, everything is gone. But we need to keep that relationship. 
So look every now and again, take a look down at your feet and say, okay. if there's light there, then it's still okay. But if you're feeling that there's a bit of shadow, or if you feel the light on your back, but it's quite cool on the front, realign yourself. Can somebody tell me the themes, the great themes of Advent? Ooh. Oh, it's up there already. <laughs> okay, so yes, we have love, we have joy, we have peace, and we have hope. And I was actually talking about this with a member of the, 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 the clergy of the Archdiocese not, not so long ago. Um, because in the prayer book we're going to be looking at this afternoon, you'll see that the themes that I have personally chosen are awakening, waiting, conversion, and hope. And I've deliberately chosen something that is slightly different from uh, what we usually hear. Because what we usually hear, we don't understand. We think that joy, it's just about the joy of Christmas. Yay, Christmas, lots of food, family, baby Jesus in a crib, fabulous. Peace, peace on earth, goodwill to all men. The little angel with the scroll above the manger. Love, as in the love of Christ when he came. And, and hope that suddenly everything is so much better just because it's nearly Christmas. But that's not what all of this is about. And the third Sunday of, of Advent is Gaudete Sunday. Uh, and it has actually very little to do with the kind of joy that you think it is. A lot of people and a lot of uh, clergy even, when they come out in their rose or pink vestments on the third Sunday, it's like a mini Christmas for them. It's not a mini Christmas. The reason why it's associated with joy is because of the first word of the entrance antiphon for that Sunday, which traditionally is Gaudete, rejoice. And it goes on, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. And we all know that bit. How do you continue? How does St. Paul go on from that? We can all say rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. But what happens next? Does anyone want to recite the rest of that verse for me? Because I've also forgotten it. No? Let me see if we can find it here. Okay, we'll try and do it from memory. Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. Uh, it should be something along the lines of let your, be, let your forbearance be known unto all men, for the Lord is at hand. Um, it's about conversion. It is about rejoicing despite the fact that we are suffering. And this is what those special Sundays in Advent and Lent are actually all about. They're not saying, Lent is over, let's have a Leitare uh, Sunday. Lent is over, we're wearing pink vestments, there's no more penance. It's not about that, but it's a reminder that even when we are fasting, even when we are denying ourselves, we must rejoice. You can't go around, and there's a gospel reading for this as well, you can't go around looking really sad and saying, oh, it's Lent, or oh, it's Friday, and I, had to, I haven't eaten meat all day. Or, or, oh, I was given a really bad penance by a priest the other day, and I'm still trying to do, oh, woe is me. Because that's not what it's all about. Even in those moments when we find ourselves dedicated to denial, we should do it happily. 
the Lord says you should cover your face with oil when you're fasting so that no one can tell that you're fasting. You should rejoice always, even though you are not allowing yourself to be happy in the full sense of the word at that moment. And that is what Gaudete Sunday is all about. That's what St. Paul is saying. He's saying we need to deny ourselves. We need to prepare for Christ's coming. The Lord is at hand. So you've got to have some sense of forbearance there, of denying yourself. But you've got to be happy about it. You've got to do it with a smile on your face. And you've got to do it in a way that is infectious, in the same way as one yawn can infect a whole group of people, so can one smile infect a whole group of people. And everything that we do as Christians, it's not about you, it's not about me as individuals, it's about spreading the good news. And you can't do that if you're dressed up in sackcloth and ashes, beating yourself on the back with a, say, oh, Christ died for my sins. He did, but it should be Christ died for my sins, even though I am fasting. Even though if we followed Milan's way of doing things, that would be 40 days of fasting, okay? It's not easy. But you need to rejoice while you're doing it. And that is the whole point of the joy of, Christmas, of Advent is not, yay, yippee, there's turkey, or yay, there's going to be a family gathering, or I love Christmas carols, so I'm so happy today. That's not the happiness or the joy we're looking for. What about the love? If we count Christmas as being about the expression of God's love, then what about Advent? It's about knowing the love of God. And you can only understand it from the, the, the saying, you don't know what you have until you've lost it, is actually very true. You have to understand in yourself what you are lacking before you can appreciate what God gives you. So what we lack in love when we look at ourselves is precisely what God gives us in love. So coming to know the love of God is not about uh, simply saying, I know God loves me, God so loved the world, we can all do the quotes, but it's coming to know that without God, with the absence of God in our lives and the absence of God in the world, love does not exist. And if you look at places of war, you look at, I mean, you don't have to look far. We can look at our, our own situation here in Malaysia, in Asia, where there are troubles is the absence of God. And if God was there, there wouldn't be the troubles that we see around us. So getting to know the love of God is about understanding what life would be like if there was not that love there. Joy then becomes understanding that you are beloved of God. What could make anyone happier than being loved? In the human sense, this is also true. We are sad when we feel that people don't love us. When people that we love, we feel that love is not returned to us. It makes us sad. How much more so is that in our relationship with God? So the joy that we need to attain through this season is actually an understanding of the immensity of God's love for us. Peace is accepting forgiveness. Half of the time our problem is that we don't forgive ourselves. We hold on to the things that are troubling us and we don't trust God enough to be able to let go of them and get rid of them, allow his light in to purge all of these things that are troubling us in our life. And hope. Hope 
not for, this is not sort of Miss World, so I can't say, oh, I hope that all the little children will be, will be fed and that the poor will be rich. And it's about a personal hope that while we're here, that person who's on the trip with us will guide us. That person who is on this road with us will never let anything happen to us. And it's only going to work that way if you believe it. It's only going to work that way if you trust him enough to walk this road hand in hand. Because the moment you let go, it's just, the moment you let go is the moment that big pothole comes up and then you trip. And then you say, oh, where was God? But actually you let go. He's there, he's with us. And the immense power of his protection and guidance. I think it's Psalm 90, I think it's Psalm 90. For me, one of the most beautiful Psalms in the whole set because it tells us so much about what God can do for us. Um, let me try and remember how it goes. It's a Compline psalm. Uh, Does anyone have access to a Bible? Because I know this, I've, because I only do Compline in Latin, so I can't. his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways on their hands they will bear you up so that you will not dash your foot against a stone you will tread on the lion and the adder the young lion and the serpent you will trample under your foot that is how it's like that's what it's like to be in love with God that's what it's like to bring him on this journey. Nothing can touch you. He will send his angels to you, to bear you in their hands so that you don't stumble or fall. We all know the imagery of the serpent, of the asp that's in this psalm. You will tread underfoot the asp and the serpent. You will tread on sin and it will not touch you. This is the psalm that is recited every night uh, at night prayer, before all of the, the changes, so you have different psalms every day. And for me, this is the single most amazing promise of God in the whole psalmody, and let's face it, the psalms are amazing sources of God's love. But this one, whenever you are in trouble, you just need to remember that God will send to you his angels to bear you in their hands so that you don't stumble or fall. That is the power of your God. And we each of us have a choice. Do we want him to come along with us? with his angels? Or do we want to walk it alone? We're very strong people. We're very strong-willed people. But there are certain things that we can do, and there are certain things that we can't do. I would rather trust in the one who would send his angels to bear me up in their hands. But it's all about trust. That is the hope, the hope of 
Advent, the hope that comes at Christmas, that we don't actually need to do anything by ourselves anymore. We don't have to keep the letter of the law and try, try our best to fulfill all of the laws that God gave to Moses, because it would be impossible to do that. What we are asked to do is to surrender ourselves totally to God on this journey and say, help me, send your angels to me. That gigantic pothole that's in front, lift me over it. And those angels, very strong, I, they can lift me as well. So that is the hope. And I know that this is different from the, the interpretation that we usually get. If you were to search for love, joy, peace, and hope on the internet for Advent themes, you would find that it's much more about Christ coming at Christmas. But actually, that's not what it is. He does come, but he comes for a reason. And when we can interpret these themes in our own lives and live them, that's when we achieve uh, what Advent is trying to achieve in us. Can we just flip on to the next one? Thank you. For Lent, we are very used to giving up something for Lent uh, as a, a share in the sacrifice of Christ. The modern church has a very nice way of trying to make this positive by asking us to take up something extra. So maybe I pray for half an hour in the morning, but actually when you do that, it's still giving up something. Because when I pray for an extra half hour in the morning, I am giving up or denying myself sleep or denying myself time when I would usually read the newspaper. Positive penance is not about giving up something. It's about acquiring something. And this is how I like to approach the season of Advent. It is a season of penitence. If we really want to do something positive, then it should be in the acquisition or development of gifts, gifts that come from God. And after the Angelus, what I'm going to be asking us to all consider is which of these spiritual gifts can we develop in ourselves during Advent to present as a gift to Christ when he comes at Christmas? So we all know about the presents and things that we get at Christmas, and we all know that the three kings brought gold, frankincense, and myrrh, and we've all heard the carol, what can I give him, give him my heart. Um, but is there a way that we can live a positive penance? And for me, that comes with discerning spiritual gifts, and there are many of them, and we'll take a look at them in a, in a second. Discerning these spiritual gifts that are of God and asking him to develop them in us for the benefit of his church, for the benefit of his people, for the benefit of ourselves, and to use those spiritual gifts as our gold, our frankincense, our myrrh, that we take to Christ at the manger and give to him. So we're not denying ourselves. We're not saying, I'm going to, I'm going to stop doing this because it's, it is a denial that is more associated with Lent and is better placed in Lent. For the penance that we do in Advent, acquiring something that we... Getting something from God, as always, this is always the model. We get something from God so that we can give it back to him. And that is what I hope that we can do. It is very nearly 12. So if we could pause for a moment.
Do you, does anyone know if the church bells ring for the Angelus on a Saturday? Then they do. Okay. Then if we can pause for a moment of silent reflection, and then in a moment we will stand for the Angelus. The angel of the Lord declared unto Mary, Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Behold the handmaid of the Lord. Hail Mary full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Pray for us, O Holy Mother of God. Pour forth, we beseech thee, O Lord, thy grace into our hearts, that we to whom the incarnation of Christ thy Son was made known by the message of an angel, my by his passion and cross, be brought to the glory of his resurrection, through the same Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. I'm going to ask Colleen now if she would mind reading a short reflection, please be seated, on the... It's a short reflection from one of the sermons that I was talking about at the beginning of this session of St. Bernard of Clairvaux. Don't worry, it's only about a paragraph or so long. It's not the one and a half an hour full version. Thank you, Colleen. Sorry. Yep, that's it. Okay. 
A reading from a sermon by St. Bernard. The kindness and humanity of God our Saviour appeared. Thanks be to God, through whom our consolation overflows in this pilgrimage, in this exile, in this distress. Before his humanity appeared, his kindness lay concealed. The latter indeed existed first, because the mercy of the Lord is from eternity. But how could man know it was so great? It was promised indeed, but not yet experienced. Hence, many did not believe in it. The Lord, indeed, spoke in fragmentary and varied fashion through the prophets, saying, I know the thoughts that I think towards you, thoughts of peace and not of affliction. But what reply did man make? Man who felt the affliction and knew nothing of peace. How long will you keep saying, Peace, peace, when there is no peace? Therefore, the angels of peace were weeping bitterly, saying, Lord, who has believed our report? But now let men believe at least their own sight, because the testimonies of God are become exceedingly credible. He has set his tabernacle in the sun, so that it cannot escape even an eye that is troubled. Behold, peace no longer promised, but conferred, no longer delayed, but given no longer predicted, but bestowed. Behold, God the Father has set down, sent down to earth as it were a bag filled with his mercy, a bag to be rent open in the passion so that our ransom which it concealed might be poured out. A small bag indeed, but full. It is indeed a small child who is given to us, but in whom dwells all the fullness of the Godhead. After the fullness of time had come, there came too the fullness of the Godhead. He came in the flesh, so that at least he might make himself manifest to our earthly minds, so that when the, this humanity of his appeared, his kindness might also be acknowledged. Where the humanity of God appears, his kindness can no longer be hidden. In what way? Indeed, could he have better commended his kindness than by assuming my flesh, my flesh that is not Adam's, as it was before the fall? What greater proof can he have given of his mercy take than by taking upon himself that which needed mercy? Where is there such fullness of loving kindness as in the fact that the word of God became perishable like the grass for our sakes? Lord, what is man, that you make much of him or pay him any heed? Let man infer from this how much God cares for him. Let him know, know from this what God thinks of him, what he feels about him. Man, do not ask about your own sufferings, but what he suffered. Learn from what he was made for you, how much he makes of you so that his kindness may show itself to you from his humanity. The lesser he has made himself in his humanity, the greater has he shown himself in kindness. The more he humbles himself on my account, the more powerfully he engages my love. The kindness and humanity of God our Saviour appeared, says the Apostle. The humanity of God shows the greatness of his kindness. And he who added humanity to the name of God gave great proof of this kindness. Thank you, Colleen. Back onto the gifts. Can we click onto the next slide? There are many gifts. St. Paul, in his letters, numbers a great many gifts, the spiritual gifts of the Holy Spirit. Exhortation, giving, leadership, mercy, prophecy, service, teaching, administration, apostleship, discernment, faith, healing, knowledge, miracles,
tongues, wisdom, evangelism, and pastorship. There is one more, but we are not, I'm not going to be encouraging you to, to have that gift. It's the gift of martyrdom. And hopefully, <laughs> hopefully that spiritual gift in our day and age is not one that we are called by, by Christ to, uh, to take on. But of these spiritual gifts, what do each of us want to be able to develop, really to try and develop in this four-week period leading up to Christmas so that we have something to say when we come to meet Christ, whether it be at the manger, in that beautiful tableau that we see with the, with the kings giving gifts, what do we want to be able to say? This is my gift to you. And a gift to Christ is a gift to his church, to the body of Christ, to the people of God. So developing these gifts is never about developing something for myself that I can enjoy. It's always about developing something that can be shared, that can benefit the whole body of Christ which is his church. So among all of these gifts, we need to be able to pray first for discernment, to be able to ask God to talk to us about what he wants us to be able to develop. For without him, we can develop nothing. But with him, even in a short four weeks, we can develop a spiritual gift to a level where it would be presentable to the Lord. But let's take a look at these gifts. First of all, and the next one, the ones that appear in Romans 12, and the next one. So that would be exhortation. Exhortation, actually you're very familiar with ex uh, exhortation. Uh, the, the word is... Uh, paraclesis so you know the paraclete as in the holy spirit so the verb in greek is paraclesis and what it actually means is to call to your side okay so what the paraclete is what the holy spirit is is the spirit of god who is by our side that calls us to the side of god hence the paraclete the exhortation, the gift, the spiritual gift of exhortation, when we think these days of exhortations, maybe we think of apostolic exhortations that the Pope gives, and they seem very top-down. So apostolic exhortations are all about this, this is, you know, you've got to do this, you've got to do that. But actually, the meaning of the spiritual gift, exhortation, is to be a magnet You've got to be able to draw people to your side. To call people to the truth. And that is a tremendous gift. We can give exhortations in the very English sense of the word and no one will listen. Not a single non-Christian will listen. If you, if you say, oh, well, yes, I want you to go to mass every Sunday. I want you to go to confession. I want you to do this, and I want you to do that, and I'm exhorting you to do this. No one's going to listen to you. But if you live it, your exhortation becomes a magnet that draws people to your side, and that is that gift. Giving, that's simple. Benevolence in sharing material resources, that's something that we all, in one way or another, do. But the giving, not necessarily, again, to the people that you like, <laughs> It's very easy to give to the worthy causes that you think uh, deserve the most, but actually there are a lot of people out there who are suffering, who would need uh, benevolent gifts of giving. Um, and it's our duty to be able to give to those regardless of their state in life or whether we think that it's worthy or not. Anyone in need is the subject of our giving. Leadership. 
When we think of leadership, maybe we think of bossy people. That's what leaders are about. Leaders are the people who say, okay, I want you to do this, I want you to do this, uh, and then everything will go smoothly. But actually, you can't have a leader unless people are following. And what a leader is, is not the person who turns around to tell you, you've got to do this. But it's the person who never turns around, who just walks. That's the leader. But you've always got to have people behind you. If there's no one behind you, then you're not a leader. And to have people behind you, they need to have confidence in you, to follow you. Because if they don't, then who knows where you're leading them. Mercy. I could definitely do with being a bit more merciful. Um, maybe that's, that's what God is calling me to, this, this advent. More forgiving of others, but also more sympathetic of others. Um, we forget that mercy is bound up with compassion, and compassion is about understanding things that people are going through and feeling what they go through. And that's definitely something that I know I could do better. I've sort of always been one of those people that there's a, there's a phrase like, you don't suffer fools gladly. So I don't, there are some things that maybe in my personal life, I don't explain things twice. If you get it, you get it. If you don't get it, ugh, I'm not bothered to explain. But that's not an expression of mercy and compassion. You've got to be in there and willing all the time to give absolutely everything to that person in, in that need. To forgive them not once and not the, the number of times that's quoted in the Bible, but infinitely for their mistakes. Mercy and compassion. Prophecy. Ah, now this is a good one. Prophecy. We all think of prophets as people who can foretell the future. So actually this is absolutely nothing to do with prophecy. Um, prophecy. Pro, to, to f draw forth, and then femi in Greek, to speak. So prophecy is to speak forth or to speak for. The prophets didn't foretell the future. Somehow we have mixed up our Hebrew scriptures with Greek philosophy, and that happened very early on in the church. So the Greeks had prophets like Sibyl, the in caves on the top of the on top of mountains, and kings would go up to her and uh, and ask her, you know, oh, is it safe to sail into this war today? And Sibyl would go into a trance and say, oh, no, it is not safe. You must sacrifice five sheep first, and then they sacrifice five sheep, and then they go and do it. That's prophecy Greek style. Prophecy Hebrew style, which is actually our style, is not about predicting the future. It's about being the voice of God, to speak for God. So when we say we want to develop the gift of prophecy, I mean, it would be helpful to tell the future sometimes, but that's not actually the gift that we're asking God to give us. We're asking God to give us the strength to be his voice in a world where his voice is so often absent. We see so many things going on, and maybe we turn a blind eye. Certainly, we don't always speak up. So the gift of prophecy is being the voice of God, to speak forth his words in places where his words are not heard. And then we have service. Diakona in, Greece, in, in Greek, to be of menial service. This is, the, the, the word is very specific. It's not about, um, oh, how can I help you? It's not that kind of service. Um, and for any deacons, they are the level of service which they're supposed to do their bishop as deacons because that's where the word comes from. It's incredibly menial. And how menial? Think of the most menial thing that Christ ever did. Washing the feet of his disciples. Quite easy, maybe. 
until you realize that out of the people that he, the feet that he washed, one of them was the one who would betray him. And he knew exactly who that was. It's not like he was washing them and he didn't know. So that type of menial service, getting your hands dirty for God, going out and doing service for everyone, even somebody who you think is going to turn around and stab you in the back. Because that is what Christ did. And that's what deacons need to do for their bishops as well. It is not um, happy service. How can, I, how can I help you? Do you want me to hold a book for you? It is, it is menial, down and dirty service. Teaching. Um, teaching here as a spiritual gift means the systematic delivering of knowledge. And as a teacher, you first need to educate yourself. So you need to gather all of the information that we have. You need then to be able to ask God to give you the grace to be able to order that information in a way that would be receptive to the people that you are teaching. We need to teach people. Not in the old-fashioned sense of lecturing people, but we need to be able to tell people and explain to people why certain things are right and certain things are wrong. Things as simple as why it's wrong to skip Sunday Mass. There are many people who do it, but, and we know that it's wrong, but why is it wrong? Finding out why it is wrong and explaining it to somebody who doesn't go regularly to Sunday Mass. Not in a way that is, you're bad because you don't go to Sunday Mass, but in a way that inspires them never to miss another Sunday Mass for the rest of their life. That is teaching. And for that, we definitely need the Holy Spirit. It is a spiritual gift. Anyone can lecture, but very few are chosen to truly teach. Then we can move on to the next one. The uh, first letter of St. Paul to the Corinthians, and the next one. Administration. For those of you who are leading uh, different ministries among us here, you are great administrators. Administration comes from the word kubernesis, kubernesis, which means to helm or to steer. So the person who steers a ship is kubernesising the ship, is administering the ship. This involves planning, organising, conceptualising and supervising the body of Christ towards God-given goals. So this can be at macro or mi micro levels. There are people who maybe look after a great number of things, like uh, liturgy is just a huge thing to be, to be looking after. Then the master of ceremonies at a particular mass would be at a micro level, looking after the running of that particular mass. Administration is incredibly important because we need people to be able to put things in good order for us, to make sure that we are going in the right direction, to make sure that we are steering towards God-given goals and not our own goals. And that's important for administrators, making sure that you're going in the direction that God would want you to go and not one that you are deciding the course for yourself. Apostleship, um, we can look to our bishops for that because they are the apostles. Apostles in Greek, again, are those who are sent, apostello, people who are sent out. And the reason why um, bishops are apostles is because apostleship means going where no one wants to go. It's not about going on holiday. 
It's about going to places where you are needed most. And in past days, dioceses weren't as small as they are today. Bishops would have to travel thousands of miles to get from one end of their diocese to another. And there are some parts of their diocese that would be completely unchristian. And it would be their job to go there to bring the word of God to places that are untouched by God, to be sent. It's not necessarily just for bishops that uh, the gift of apostleship is, is given. There are apostolates that are both lay and religious, as you will know, and all of those embody the gift of apostleship, being sent by God to somewhere that needs you. And of course, all of this involves discernment. Discernment being able to align yourself with God, to be able to, no matter, life spins us around sometimes, but discernment is getting ourselves back on track. That horrible moment when your ways makes that noise that says you've gone the wrong way. It goes, and then it says, okay, now you've got to go here and you've got to go there. That thing is discernment. It's being done for you by a computer. We need to pray for it when we've lost our way. But that's basically what it is. It's realigning ourselves. We've somehow made a wrong turn somewhere. So we need to recalibrate. We need to, I can't remember what the old GPS systems used to say. They, used, they, they had a phrase, re, recalculating. That is discernment, recalculating looking where we are right now, checking where we are in terms of our di direction, and recalculating our route to make sure we are on the right track. And faith. What could be more important than faith? But the gift of faith is one that we have to nurture. The, co the consistency of faith, the conviction of our faith, the tenacity of our faith, the world is amazing at rocking that. Just when we feel closest to God, something can happen that dashes our belief, that pulls us away, that says to us here in our mind that it's useless believing in God when these things are happening around us. Our faith is shaken by so many things. But asking God to give us strength of faith, tenacity, that ability to be able to have faith no matter what is going on around us. That's the faith of the apostles who died for Christ. That kind of faith. If we want to develop that as a spiritual gift, that is perhaps the most valuable gift of all from which all of the other gifts come. Healing, physically caring for the sick, bringing them, to the, bringing them to the best of health, that is true. But also healing those who are emotionally sick, those who are spiritually sick, those who, who are maybe even mentally sick. The idea of healing those who are spiritually sick should be very important for us. Because all of us go through those times where our faith dwindles or is questioned or is not as hot as it used to be. And in a community, what a church is supposed to be is we're supposed to notice when somebody doesn't show for a few weeks, when somebody doesn't come to Mass. And the gift of healing means that, ah, oh, Mrs. So-and-so, I haven't seen her for weeks. I wonder how she is. And the gift of healing then is to go and visit Mrs. So-and-so, and to ask her why she hasn't been to church, to find out what might be causing that problem, and to heal her, whatever those wounds may be, 
to give her healing, either in body, in spirit, mental, emotional. There are so many facets to it, but it means going out and touching those who are in need. Knowledge is simple. To get to know our faith better, that's a mountain that none of us can climb fully in this life. There is so much to learn. But to, to come with the intention at the beginning of Advent to know more about your faith, to read maybe the catechism from beginning to end, which is very difficult sometimes, um, to know more, to enjoy the process of discovering more, or maybe set yourself a simple task, a section of faith, maybe to understand, um, to understand the church's beliefs in Marian devotion, say for instance, more deeply, to understand why we have such a devotion to Mary, why people oppose that devotion to Mary, and coming to, to have that knowledge so that then you can go on to do other things with that knowledge, to teach, for example. So you can make these tasks as big or as little as you like, but it's something that you need to be manageable for yourself, to know your faith better. Miracles. We are not necessarily talking about those big flash of light in the sky kind of miracles. It would be very nice if we were in such a state of grace that we could perform miracles on behalf of God. Um, Ooh, is there miracles there? No, I missed miracles. Miracles. Um, to perform great feats on behalf of God. And remember, if you can get three of them, you automatically become a saint. <laughs> the point of miracles, I'm only joking, by the way, you don't become a saint. Um, the point of miracles is to be able to show people the power of God and to make them believe in our God through his mighty works. And they could be mighty, mighty, like parting the Red Sea. I can't do that. I mean, I don't know. Maybe you could try it at the local river or something. But they don't have to be that big. It doesn't have to be something that's totally impossible. But it is showing that God has power. Power to comfort. Power to help. Power to touch someone's soul. The fact that you can turn somebody who has no belief in God into somebody who believes in God is an exercise of that great power of the Almighty. We can perform miracles every day, little ones. We leave the big ones to the saints, but we do have a mission. And acquiring that gift of being able to perform miracles is asking God to make me a channel of your great power in this world. To allow me to show people how powerful you are through whatever way we, he wants to show it. The, differ the difference between miracles and magic, magic is what the person, the magician, wants to perform something, if magic was real. Magic is not real. But if, the, if magic was real, magic is, I want to turn this phone into a rabbit. And then, boom, it turns into a rabbit. When we are magicians for God, we have no choice. So it's not about me saying, I want to part the Red Sea. It's not about Moses saying, I want to part the Red Sea. It's about Moses saying, we got to get out of here. These people are chasing us on chariots. What do we do? And then raising his staff. Ah, we're going to die. And then suddenly, he's that 
channel for the miracle. But he didn't perform it himself. It wasn't his choice. I'm sure he would have preferred a bridge rather than parting the Red Sea. It would have been a lot easier to walk across. But God chooses, and that is the beauty of miracles. It's not what we want to do, it's what he wants to do through us. And from that perspective, we're not relying on our power, but on the power of God. And that power is limitless. So you don't need to doubt on whether you can do it or not. You just have to believe that if you ask God to work through you, whether it's big or small, he will act through you if you allow him to. Tongues. We're about to eat so I will go through tongues very quickly. Um, the gift of tongues, and I was discussing this last night. Um, the gift of tongues, sometimes we're quite frightened of the gift of tongues because we somehow it's, it's taken by other, some groups to mean talking in a language that is incomprehensible. If you look at how tongues is addressed in the Bible, it is about talking to people in their own language. So the gift of tongues for the apostles was the sudden ability to be able to talk in all of the languages of the people of Jerusalem. It was not talking in a language that nobody but God understands because there's no point to that. What I said in the beginning is that all of these gifts, all of them that we have mentioned, are not for ourselves. They are for the body of Christ. They are for the church. So any gift that is just for me, that I'm gonna guard like this and say, this is my gift just for me and God, automatically is not a gift of the Spirit. A gift of the Spirit is always used to channel outwards. It's not about you. It's never about you. It's about God and his people. So the gift of tongues could be a language that you never knew you could speak. It certainly was for the apostles on that day of Pentecost. But it also means the ability to be able to talk to people at their own level to talk to people in a way that makes them listen and understand. I am a great lover of liturgy, of beautiful liturgy. But there's no point in sending me, with, armed with the great liturgies of the church, to a poor beggar woman at the side of the street. I say, come with me to church where there are beautiful vestments and mitres and gold and gold ceilings and, and marble. And she say, what? That is the opposite of the gift of tongues because that poor woman on the side of the street is gonna say, you crazy boy. <laughs> the gift of tongues would be to be able to have the love that I have for the glory of God through art and through the liturgy of the church, but nonetheless to be able to speak to that woman in terms that she understands that Christ healed the sick. Christ came for the poor. Christ loves everyone equally. You don't need to be well-dressed to come to church as long as you come. This would be language that I wouldn't normally speak in but it would be language that God gives me to be able to speak to a particular group of people. The message of Christ is not the same for everyone. And our ability to not change the message, but to change the tone and the approach of the message is the gift of tongues. Wisdom, finally, before lunch. Wisdom is not being clever. Wisdom and wise people are not necessarily clever people. Wise people allow God to be clever for them. Wisdom is of God. Again, it's not a gift for me. I am not wise because I study. 
I am not wise because I have a lot of information that I have gathered in front of me. I am wise because God uses his knowledge through me to do his will. And that is wisdom. And that's why in the Miserere we have that amazing verse. Then in the secret of my heart, teach me wisdom. What an amazing gift it is. And it's the gift that so often, it's why it's in a penitential psalm, that we are without. Wisdom is being able to apply the knowledge of God to our life. To be able to walk his knowledge, live his knowledge, dream his knowledge. That is wisdom. It is pure divinity. It's not being clever. There are lots of clever people who are not wise. But there are no wise people who are not clever. Shall we break for lunch? <laughs> knowledge. Which one? I thought I said knowledge. Did I say knowledge? Yes. I said it was, I, I think I did. I, knowledge being about finding out more about your faith. Maybe choosing an area of it and reading up on it, becoming an expert in it. If you have any questions, troubles, issues, anything at all, or just want to say hi, then I will be here while you're having lunch. Um, come by and say, and say hi. But please do enjoy your lunch. I know it's going to be, it's going to be fabulous from what I hear. Thank you.